Welcome to the Global Sport Matters podcast under the uh, guise of Old Head's New Thoughts with all the greats once again. Let's start off ladies first. We have the great Rachel Lofton. Hello, hello. Hello. One of the big leaders of the Global Sport Institute. Oh, I'm Ken Shropshire. I guess I should say who I am first. <laughs> uh, we have the great James Lofton, the Hall of Famer who has gone through a, a whole week of dreams, waking up thinking, oh, am I on time? Am I going to miss the game <laughs> <laughs> when it's kickoff? But but he survived. James, welcome. President and accounted for right here. All right. And of course, uh, my sidekick, legendary <laughs> author, writer, scholar, former jazz critic, Bill Rose, Morgan State's greatest. <laughs> hello 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 Good all right to be so we're, we're gonna cover a, a few things there we're gonna do a, a super bowl kind of recap and get some thoughts on where we are and where the super bowl stands in the pantheon of, of super bowls and then of course it it would not be uh a show under the global sport matters guys if we don't have a, a race conversation but we'll talk about <laughs> some of the hirings that have taken place in terms of, of head coaches and and assistants and special assistants and that sort of thing since uh since the game has ended so let, let's start off um james i happen to recall at some point somebody asked you about your first super bowl and that you were privileged enough if i recall correctly to have gone with your father right uh, and I always, I was always jealous of you because I remember my father was trying to get us to go, and then somehow somebody figured out how to pick up Channel Six from San Diego or something like that for the <laughs> hanger. But we're in LA, the the the, the first Super Bowl. Uh, what what do you remember about that, and how's that compare with 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 your Super Bowl journey? Well, well, it's it's funny because when you look back in time, you kind of put things together, you string things together. So I think of all the occasions that I was at the uh, Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. I was there for the Vons Classic. And anybody who knows that, Vons was a grocery store and they had a track meet there. And the big event that they had at the track meet was for a hundred yards, people would push shopping carts and they would get a hundred dollars. So I remember that distinctly. I also remember sitting in the stands watching James Harris play quarterback for the Los Angeles Rams, but at, at that AFL NFL championship game, because it wasn't called the Super Bowl at the time, I distinctly remember the tickets were $8. The, the expensive wow. tickets were $12. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We had $8 tickets and we moved down every quarter closer to the 50 yard line, closer to ideal viewing spot because the stadium just wasn't full. And, and as a, what, Ten nine year old kid. I also remember that I got a soda, and I got a hot dog. So I was, <laughs> I, I was set. I, you know, vaguely remember. You know, now it's been imprinted in there that there was Jetpack Man and different things like that. And there was a band. Was Grambling the band that played at the Super Bowl? Or I think that was FAMU. HBCU, yeah. FAMU might have been the band that played at halftime. So yeah. I remember that. But that band being Black didn't didn't mean a whole lot to me because my whole neighborhood was Black. So I thought, well, that's <laughs> the way it is. <laughs> that's um, funny. B Bill, you, you remember the first one? I mean, I mean, uh, any, any special moment? I know you remember because you were a grown man by that time. But. Well, no, I mean, the, the very first, yeah, I know I was like 50 years old, right? <laughs> no, well, uh, I think my first, my first live one was, uh, I think, like 1992. But I really remember the very first Super Bowl because, you know, I was a big, I loved the AFL. I love the AFL. And um, also, I love Kansas City. You know, that was my team because Kansas City always had a lot of HBCU players on it. Right. Uh, you know, Willie Lanier from Morgan, uh, my guy Emmett Smith. I love Emmett Smith, who went, I think, to Bishop. Uh, Jim Marsalis, you know, went to Tennessee State. Uh, uh, you know, Bobby Bell. So I love Kansas City. And then, of course, you had Fred, 
the Hammer Williamson, who was talking all that trash. And of course, Green Bay just totally destroyed them, <laughs> you know. Um, so I just, I just remember I was more into the whole AFL, NFL part of it, you know, um, not the how big it was and all that. Just could the AFL beat the big time NFL? Uh, and those were my memories of the first two. And um, it really wasn't until I went to my first one that that's sort of my sense of comparison. How like 1992, you know, when you look at that Super Bowl and then you look at 2023 and the whole halftime thing and just how it's, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, Rachel was talking about, you know, people just tuned in to see just halftime, you know, uh, that's just become a thing or two itself. But um, yes, yeah, it's, it's just a um, phenomena how it's, how it's grown. And I guess the last thing I say, you know, I'm always aware of these things, of all the events. I always become aware of the events I'm missing, <laughs> you know, you know, because the Super Bowl has become just this, this, you know, avalanche of events, of parties, and this one, then that one. So um, I'm sure we'll, we'll parse it, but um, yeah, it's just a, a, a phenomenal genuflection toward American capitalism, how the game of... <laughs> how the game of football has just morphed into uh, more than a game, but this cultural, uh, this cultural event. And, and James, you, you've got enough out there, been raw. I want to hear your, your uh, initial Super Bowl moments in life, what, what you remember first. But James? You know, Bill hit on something. It was interesting because I was at that Super Bowl one, but when I was a young player in the league and probably could have gotten – tickets to go see a Super Bowl, I didn't want to go. Oh. I wanted to quote, wait until I got a chance to play in it and to think about it at that point. But Bill mentioned 1992. Bill, I was playing in that game. That, so oh, that's right. <laughs> Buffalo. Hopefully you weren't rooting against me. But <laughs> after I'm rooting, I, rooting for the story. <laughs> and and, and it, it is interesting when he mentioned the events and the parties because I've gotten to be a part of the Super Bowl either as a broadcaster or working with a network who's broadcasting the game. So you get invited to a lot of the more A-list parties. When you're no longer on that A-list, you then feel like you're in town and you're missing out on something. And you, you are missing out on it because on a Thursday night, there might be 50 different events spread around the town and you may go to one or two at the most. And right. then you hear about all these other ones the next night and you go, oh, I didn't know Shaq was doing this. I didn't know. Right. So such and such a celebrity was doing that. So you're right. The the events that surround the game, because in Phoenix this last week, there were a million people in town mm, to go yeah. to a game that seated 65, 70,000 people. So it's the events that now make up the Super Bowl. And it's the halftime show that is the, the crown jewel. Yeah, yeah, everybody's waiting to see who wins the game. But more importantly, who's performing at halftime. Yeah. yeah. So, Rob, for, for our, our generational uh, distinction. Well, I'd first like to say I was robbed of attending three Super Bowls. Um, <laughs> my dad played in them. My mom had the ethical idea of not to bring a baby to a game, especially when <laughs> they didn't have baby headphones. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not heard about it. I just think about it. You know, well, wait, you, but you've been to others <laughs> subsequently, though. <laughs> no, but having been able to go in the past couple of years has been wonderful. Um, but in thinking about the events, you know, we often hear about how much money comes into the city. And I worked in hospitality and in food and beverage for a little bit. And so when I looked at the events this weekend, I'm thinking of some of the people that got to reap the benefits. So when we think about all these parties at hotels and restaurants, I always think about the hourly wage workers that are now making money. And even I was I saw one photographer at an event we went on Tuesday, and I saw him at three more events following during the week. Um, so it, it was interesting to kind of have a look back and think about what they mean when they're talking about all this money flowing into town, who's actually getting it. And so it was kind of nice to think that there is some economic opportunity for our hourly wage workers. Um, but then also, I mean, it was fun. You know, there's also bougie moments. Uh, but it, it was nice 
having gone to a couple A-list parties is nice, but I also went to a couple just local parties of local organizations. Um, and that was also nice because now you have people still communing together, coming out for something special. It might not be at Shaq's party. It might just be at the local restaurant down the street and there might only be 50 people, uh, but you're still having this unique experience where people are coming together that may or may not have come together before. Uh, and I've just enjoyed seeing that growth and being able to kind of partake in at a bunch of different levels, but still being able to feel like I'm a part of something special. So Ray, could you please, as one who goes to those, the little bitty party you talked about, yeah, and, and never the A-list, could you tell me about some of the A-list parties? Because I'd never go to the A-list party. <laughs> could you, so just could you kind of share some of the experiences of the A-list parties? One of my favorite A-list parties, I believe it was in New Orleans, we semi snuck into the ESPN party. So my dad had an invitation. My brother, sister-in-law and I did not but that we were going to try to go anyways. My sister-in-law is pregnant. My brother, David, kind of looks like my dad. So we're like, maybe we could swing it and just pretend that David's my dad. And then even I was trying to get my sister-in-law to milk the pregnancy. I was like, just say you have to sit down and you need to get inside, <laughs> which she wouldn't. <laughs> but as we're kind of weaseling our way through the crowd, all of a sudden this tall, beautiful woman turns around and says, oh, are you trying to get inside? And I was like, yes, Miss Lolo Jones, I am. She's like, come on in. Um, so that was fun. We snuck into a party with Lolo Jones. Um, and, you know, you have all these celebrities there. Uh, I remember being starstruck at Jesse Williams from Grey's Anatomy, who's also just an amazing advocate and human humanitarian. Um, and so it was also interesting to be in a space where you have all these elite athletes and being in a room and looking around like, oh, I'm with Olympians, little old me, who was decent in high school track, but in no way on these level. And so it it is also cool to see these elite athletes interacting with each other and almost fangirling and fanboying about each other and seeing other athletes that they admire in different sporting events and different fields. Uh, so they're fun. You get to dress up. You get a lot of nice free food, free drinks. I will say the free food is probably the best part of the A-list parties. They have good food. Yeah. You know, as I listen to this, I had not... Uh, the Super Bowl for me was always going in my parents' basement, even when I was too old to be going over there and watch <laughs> friends over and watching the game with this kind of same cast of characters uh, forever. And then, uh, and thank thank you, Rachel. I didn't I didn't realize that was a connection. <laughs> when, when James did start to go, then many of us who were in that basement ended up going to the Super Bowl. Be basically, thanks to your mother. I mean, Be Beverly was the one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she's like james you should have some of your friends come give them this opportunity uh to, to come so so that was kind of beginning period then, then when that uh gravy train ran out <laughs> you know i kind of stopped again and then i started working for you know doing work for the nfl and they gave me the tremendous opportunity to purchase super bowl tickets which, mm. which you know is, is becoming less and less of a uh of a, of a benefit of, of consulting with them because the price has just gotten way out of control. And, um, you know, the only way to, to get real access is to be a Hall of Famer or something or be for some kind of path where you right. get into the game. But but going to, um, to these events has become a real uh, connecting point. I mean, and not so much for, you know, celebrity connections, but, but now friends, people that, that have gone... Uh, for years, and you, you look forward to seeing them, and the and the game is you know le less important. You know, this time, Philly's in, so I had kind of a a different kind of feeling as as, as a fan. Um, but when you know when James was playing, it was you know you had somebody to root for, and and then and all of us remember this moment when you stop having friends who are actually playing. You say, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. who would I root for? Do I still have this? we all move from our hometowns, and it becomes a whole whole different way of of looking at sport but but this 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 one was uh you know built a little bit differently we talked about it because two black quarterbacks and rihanna coming back um you know five years of or whatever it's been since she's she's performed um and it was kind of this whole aura of this is going to be a even though it's in arizona kind of a, a blacker super bowl than than it had been 
Bill, why don't we start off with you? I mean, how how black was and you did a you did a, a great piece. Uh, what, what what's the what's the magazine called now? <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. No, Anscape. <laughs> yeah, 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 Anscape. You did a great piece in Anscape where you, you did what we, you did what we had kind of talked about. So I was fascinated by it. you went to the black barber shop. You actually did yeah. find a black barber shop in Phoenix that does exist, Scottsdale yeah. actually, to find out who uh, who black people were rooting for. But but how yeah. in the broader sense, how how black was the Super Bowl for you? Yeah, that's pretty, well, that that was pretty black. You know, talk about the A list. That was my A list. That was my that was my A list experience. I spent uh, Saturday uh, three four hours Saturday at this black barber shop. I'm a big barber black barber shop guy, and so I think we talked about that. I was wondering, you know, typically who would the black barber shop universe be rooting for on Sunday? And typically, you know, if, if it was just Philadelphia versus Cincinnati. You knew that you know the black barber shop universe would be going for Philadelphia and Jalen Hurts, or if it was Kansas City against San Francisco, the black barber shop universe would be cheering for Mahomes. So I said, okay. Now, in, 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 on, a, on a day like this, when you have two brothers uh, in the Super Bowl, who would the black barber shop universe be going for? So I found this one. I don't know if it's the only black barber shop in Arizona, <laughs> but, but it, it was this young <laughs> in, in, in the in the four well, four corners area, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and in the re, in the region. <laughs> so it was this young brother. Yeah, I think it, it, it's called uh, uh, Mug and Mug and Maine, and uh, it was it was uh, it was very intriguing just to hear the debates, uh, even the intracultural debates about. The brown skin brother versus biracial brother, which is, you know, very touchy subject. I mean, it's it's a great subject. It's a touchy subject. You know, who's more authentic? And so, you know, the brother I'm talking to is well, you know, of course he had on the big Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> the Patrick Mahomes, uh, uh, Kansas City uh, uh, jersey, but he was talking about well, yeah, you know, uh, Hertz is very authentic. You know, he reminds me of Michael Vick and blah 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 and this and if he if he came to a black barber shop, he would probably know which chair to go to and all that. I said, yeah, but having said that, you're wearing Mahomes jersey, and he said, yeah, you, you'd be a fool to go to, to go against Mahomes. But it was um, great, and everybody started going down memory lane. Everybody started calling out the black quarterbacks who defined their careers. Like uh, the the barber uh, is from Washington State, so of course he grew up knowing at least about Warren Moon. But he said his guy was Dante Culpepper. And then somebody else mentioned, uh, who's, who's the guy, you know, oh, who's the guy, Jefferson Street? What was the guy's name? <laughs> and of course, I, I knew it. You mean Joe Gillum? Yeah. Uh, so it was, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a fun experience uh, to do that. And, uh, but yeah, to answer your overall question, was it the Blackest Bobby? When you said that, I thought of uh, Kerry Lake, you know, because I had a, a fascinating uh, experience in the press box, which is still predominantly white, overwhelmingly white. And so when Cheryl Re Re Lee Ralph came and sang the um, uh, Negro National Anthem, you know, she started singing. So I just stood up, you know. Yeah. And so there's a brother sitting next to me, looked at me, so he stood up. And then it's funny, like all the other people looked around and you saw everybody was eating and all that. So one after the other, Everybody starts standing up. <laughs> oh, I guess we're supposed to be standing up, right? That's you know. Funny, said, Bill, Bill, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, like, my wife and I were sitting down there, and you know, Shirley Ralph came out and started yeah. singing. And I looked at her, I said, Oh, we're supposed to be standing up. They're black right. black national anthem. And right. she right away stood up, and I I had some hesitation. I don't know, is it you know, am I gonna offend anybody by standing up? I, I did have <laughs> there, a, there, there you go. Correct. I had a moment of, of doing it. But but in, in everybody's defense, they didn't say please rise right the Negro right. Yeah. They didn't right. say that. Right. It, it was left you kind of had either it, it, it felt on your whole cultural sense of identification right. whether you did wow. or not. And then I gotta tell you man and I think you went through that too uh, when you did stand up and you were the only one standing up, it was sort of one of those experiences. I mean, you know, I went to an HBCU, so I was always used to be around. But, but but you stood up and you were like the only one in this press box that was like kind of standing up. 
And, you know, it was just kind of a bizarre experience. It's so funny that Carrie Lake, probably speaking for a whole lot of people, you know, saying, why am I supposed to stand up? You know, why, why do I have to stand up? You know, it was, it was so, you know, to answer your question, was it the blackest Super Bowl? Yeah, in one sense, but I think it still raises this sort of dilemma of being black in the United States, what that, what that means, even in 2023. Well, you know, Chris Stapleton did sing the national, the real, the, the real, I mean, the uh, PWI or the, yeah. whatever, did this sing the national anthem. Uh, right. No, here, here comes hate, hate mail. See, James, you missed this. I, I, my goal is not to get labeled Uncle Tom by Bill anytime I say anything. I, I felt myself on the cusp right there. <laughs> I, trust me, I understand. I understand. <laughs> you know what I was trying to say. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, your your wife led the way. Fortunately, Diane led the way. She said, Negro stand. This is the Negro national anthem. Negro stand. <laughs> but then the other the other challenge is that if they if they if, if you had to sing the words, that's yet the other, that's like the other challenge. How many people really? <laughs> how'd you how, give many, a, how many verses can you get through? Right? Yeah, one. Well, the first one I sent, I sent a friend the, the copy because she was saying, "Well, I was proud, but I don't know the whole." So I sent her the the copy of it, and then I sent the second verse. That nobody knows this, but I just sent it anyway. Nobody knows the second second stanza. But yeah, I thought it was. Uh, but I'm glad you ended up standing up, uh, uh, Ken. Good. That was a good hopefully, look. Hopefully, there's no film because it, <laughs> it was not pretty. It was not pretty. But Diane jumped. jumped. I, I mean, I said to her, she did get a hint from me. And, you know, sometimes you can express what she did. I should have just, you know, it's like, like the same baby on the railroad tracks. You should just do it. And I said, somebody needs to get that child. <laughs> right. Oh, um, man. Bill, next time you come to town, I'll have to give you the name of my barber. Um, was also very hard to find, but he's great. But in listening to what you guys were talking about earlier in the first couple Super Bowls and the halftime performances, Grambling State was the first two years, and then FAMU. Oh, uh, okay. I feel like we're just going back to the original halftime show that was already Black. Right. <laughs> and so everyone's like kind of having a moment. I'm like, but it was kind of always Black, and then it went kind of more multicultural, and now we're back. But it, for me, it was something to be able to see Cheryl Lee Ralph sing Lift Every Voice. But one of the stars that came out of this uh, whole football game, including halftime, was Justina Miles, who was hmm. the young Black sign language interpreter for both Cheryl Lee Ralph's uh, performance as well as Rihanna. And she's blown up all over the internet. She is 20 years old, a Philly native. Ah. Uh, she goes to Boise State University. And she was on the 2021-22 Deaf Olympics uh, four by one team, which she got silver medal in Brazil. So oh. even when we're talking about, is it the Blackest? Yes, maybe, but also the most progressive. Yeah. Um, I talked to a couple of friends and, you know, we're all talking about one, it was amazing just to see the representation and having a sign language interpreter, but also to be able to see a young black girl who's doing it. And it was amazing. She was a performance in herself. Um, and so looking at that and just kind of how things are shifting, it's also wonderful to see like, again, kind of going back to how we began, but also this different level of inclusivity and being able to see yourself represented. And I know even listening to a couple of interviews with Rihanna beforehand, talking about wanting to represent Barbados, coming from this small um, island, but also feeling the pressure to represent all Black people. Um, so it for me, it was wonderful to see on so many different levels of just seeing us represented in all these different ways and spaces. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was, uh, oh, go, go ahead. Uh, no, I was gonna say, with the second, was it the second most viewed halftime show? The, the second to Katy Perry, I think it was. Um, I don't remember the Katy Perry halftime show. I don't remember that either. <laughs> I mean, I only I, remember because it was one of the few I went to. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but I thought it was I thought it was sort of intriguing that because Rihanna was one of the people who originally uh, refused to uh, perform at halftime in support of Colin Kaepernick. You know, right. she she had been very clear that, you know, that she was not going to perform because of the NFL treatment of Kaepernick. And I was reading her, you know, justification <laughs> of, of why she decided to come back. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it's interesting, the whole idea, remember, you know, Black people need to boycott the NFL. 
<laughs> in the Good NFL luck said, okay, we'll go ahead. We don't care. That doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter to us. So is there a yeah. better way to take action by by showing up and, and you know, like Beyonce's yeah. halftime show of, of delivering a message in that kind of way is is, uh, is a better path than, than I'm not coming. Well, okay. You guys keep keep boy hot and good boy the NHL too. We yeah. yeah. Well, they they, they, they cared enough. They, they cared enough, Ken. They cared enough to reach out to Jay Z. I mean, they they, <laughs> they you know they cared enough enough to you know to, to reach out to Jay Z and ask him would he kind of be the Pied Piper right. uh, to bring these black performers back. But I I hear your I, I hear what you're saying. Generally, they don't care. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, and financially they they don't they don't need to. I mean, the idea of we need we need women to watch. We need uh, the Latino population to be on board. But right, uh, you know, this little eleven percent of the country is. Yeah. We, we just need y'all. We just need y'all to play. We need you to play. That, right, that, exactly. We don't need you to boycott. <laughs> which which leads to our our <laughs> our, our closing topic yeah. is the hiring that took place post post Super Bowl, and and this is. You know, so this is, uh, I think we, we, we realize this time the whole idea of Black Monday didn't really happen in the way that, that we've seen it. But now there is this post Super Bowl day, I guess, in yeah. terms of which coordinators are going to get hired that have been kind of in reserve because they've been in the process for so long. And James, you've you watched this, this for years. And this, so, so this time we end up with the two coordinators, defensive offensive from the Eagles, the losing team. Right. getting hired and then then nobody from the chiefs getting hired what, what, what's your what's your view of the whole scenario you saw well and i just need to throw this last nugget in before we jump to the coaches okay. in week one of last season the very first game i have is lamar jackson baltimore going to play the new york jets you know on a on a huge stage and lamar jackson being a former nfl mvp and last year, there were 68 starting quarterbacks in games in the National Football League. And I said, I wonder how many were men of color. Well, there were 28 men of color who started games. And, um, and it's, I wow. mentioned men of color because Mariota and Tua are, are men of color. So I'm looking at that. Right. And if you just look at day one starters for their particular franchise, 13. And so I had to put a slash there with Jacoby Brissett and Deshaun Watson in Cleveland, but 13. So it, it didn't surprise me that we might end up with Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes because the better players, you, you don't get a chance to start in the NFL unless you're really good. And you have to be, again, doubly good as a black quarterback to be a starter. So 13 day one starters. So as I, as I transfer that to coaching, because I was in those coaching ranks, I had had coaching interviews, and you, you kind of know when you're going in whether or not you're going to get a job. I, I, I see, you know, so-and-so went to talk to this team, and, and then they took their name out of contention. Well, they took their name out of contention because there was going to be no offer forthcoming, and nobody wants to be on the list of he didn't get hired. And that's where we sit with Eric Bieniemy. I think it's 17 times now that he's interviewed for, for head coaching jobs. And when I look at the landscape and I sit down in meetings and talk to these very young head coaches, what's, what's the old phrase? They don't know stuff from Shinola. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they are so green. And so... You know, I, I very rarely do I walk out of a room with a 30-something year old and go, boy, was he impressive. The, the last time that happened was Brian Flores. Mm. And Brian Flores was just so put together in, in our meeting and what he wanted to accomplish. You know, I'm going, this, this is a guy I'd want to play for. And unfortunately, you know, he rubbed up against the quarterback a little bit. And so that, that quarterback has a lot of power. And anybody who gets to kind of touch the quarterback's coattails is now all of a sudden a quarterback whisperer and important. So that pipeline, being a quarterback coach, being an offensive coordinator, being a play caller, or even having a head coach who's a great play caller normally works with the exception of Eric Bieniemy. 
in the exception of a Pep Hamilton. Guys who, right. who I have a lot of uh, admiration for because I, I know how difficult of a job it is to put together a game plan, how many hours it takes, what you need to edit out, what you need to tell the quarterback he's not good at when he thinks he's actually good at it. So I get disappointed during the, during the coaching cycle, but then there are, are small rewards. And one of the things that coaches, black coaches talk about when we see each other on the field before the game is I still got a job. You know, you know, you're climbing the ladder, but you still got a job and those jobs aren't handed out fairly. And you realize that. And, and that's, I guess that's the most disappointing factor. Somebody looked at uh, Leslie Frazier's accomplishments against Gannon's accomplishments, the offensive defensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles. And it was a blind draw. And everybody said, well, that guy right there is the guy I'd hire. Well, that was Leslie Frazier. Same thing happened when you looked at Eric Bannon Eric Bannon against all these other guys who were getting hired and they're going, that's the guy I would hire. That's the guy who wasn't hired. So it, it is ultra disappointing, but I'm always still optimistic for the next chance. When David Culley got the head coaching job with the Houston Texans a couple of years ago, I was ecstatic for him because he was in his sixties. And knowing that I'm knowing that he's getting a four or five year contract that he deserves after all the years he's been in the NFL, go ahead and fire him after a year. Let him walk away with $15 million. Just like you let Matt Rule do in Carolina, walk away with a bag full of money and you knew he was the wrong hire off the bat. So I'd rather have a black coach be a mistake or get fired early. At least he got an opportunity. And then maybe he'll get that second chance like a Lovey Smith did, like a Jim Caldwell did. But it, it's just not happening through the through the proper channels for the young black coaches. You shouldn't have to wait till you're 50 and everybody else who's been into the league from a Division three school gets a chance when they're 34, yeah. 35. And, and you know what's disturbing for me, and I know we're, we're closing out, but what's disturbing to me, and I, I don't think this is accidental, what these, what these NFL owners are doing is ensuring that for the next 30, 40 years, by hiring these young white boys as, as coaches, that for the next 30 years, you're going to make sure that the infrastructure of this coaching fraternity is going to be predominantly white, you know, because they're going to hire their guys who are in turn going to be hiring. So it's not just this hiring. And, and it's almost like they're saying, well, we know we can't control, you know, okay, you guys are talking about two black quarterbacks. That's great. We can't control that because we need them to win. But in those areas that are subjective, you know, when it comes to the, the, the coaching thing, we can't control that. We can't ensure a white future for the next 20, 30 years. That's what's sort of disturbing. And I guess what's frustrating is, and I, I guess I asked you guys is, how do you, what's your leverage? Because you're dealing with these multi-billionaires who are almost like, they're, they're almost like, uh, uh, um, uh, who's the mayor of Alabama? Uh, who stood in the schoolhouse door, uh, Wallace. They're almost like George yeah. Wallace and defiantly saying, you know, segregation now, segregation forever. It's almost like they will not be moved. That to me is, is the most frustrating thing all because you're talking about people who are saying, there's nothing you can do to make me do the right thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, George Wallace, Lester Maddox, so, so all those yeah. guys, the difference was they were overt. They they would pull out ax handles and block them. Right. But, but the decisions, that these guys are making it, like you said, as James said, defies all all logic in right. terms of of who you should select. Um, and and there's there's nothing other than this gut kind of thing of this guy reminds me of myself. They don't say that anymore, yeah, right? That that allows these decisions to be made. And we are at, at the same number that we had when the Rooney Rule began, so to, to, to 2003. So we're, there's 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 been change but no progress which is one of those themes things we we talk about and you know i i, I for one do a lot of work with the league on this and, and nothing, nothing to brag about in terms of the success clearly clearly somebody else needs to be hired to try to figure out paths to do this but it's it's you know we we got to move away from and bill you said this right we got to move away from this this whole idea of uh, the black candidates have to go to special networking events and you know, uh, have special consultants on how to dress <laughs> right. in interviews. All this <laughs> right. foolishness right. That, that we've had. Those, those, everything I understand, 
those two gentlemen that got hired off the Eagles didn't have to do any any of these special seminars. All right. they had to do was It'd be, be white. there and be, and be available. They, they probably yeah. did not even go interview in person because their teams were still playing. Probably, so probably didn't video, interview in person. Video interviews. Yeah. So it, it's, it's I, I for one am, am uh, frustrated. Raw, you, you worked deeply on the data that we did at the Global Sport Institute over the years. And, and as I think about it, we, we're tracking things like where they go to school, how old are they? So to all these things trying to find out, is there some nuance that tells us what the di differentiator is and, and why the, the white candidates are hired and the, and the black candidates are? And really all we found was stuff like uh, they tend to hire younger white guys, the outlier at, at, at the time, you know, Bruce Arians was the one old, old, you know, white one person, like Cully kind of, kind of stuck in and, and push the numbers up a little bit, but for the most part, we had to have a lot of experience. Uh, it, was, it was rare that we got the job coming off. You know, well, never did we get a job coming off being the, the special teams coach or coming out of the broadcast booth. So to all these right. things that say, that, well, the rule is there are no rules. I mean, that, that, there, there is no uh, pipeline. I mean, and please let us never use that word in terms of what, what we don't have. Right. We are we are available in the same way that the, that the white candidates are available. But Roz, you see, if you've seen this and, and think about the data and otherwise, what 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 are your your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, we looked at a lot of different factors in our field studies, everything from previous playing experience, previous coaching experience, and the trend is the same as it is in larger society. As a black person, you have to get you have to be twice as good to get half as far. You know, in this last hiring cycle, Kevin O'Connell is 36 and he was the youngest coach hired. Uh, Lovey Smith was 63 and Todd Bowles was 58. And so you are seeing these trends of you have to wait twice as long as a black coach to get an opportunity. And often you don't get a second chance if that opportunity doesn't go as your owner wants it to go. Um, and you do see that pipeline that we don't have access to that quarterbacks coach to offensive coordinator to head coach and you see these wonder kids coming up at 34 years old first time offensive coordinator then the following season they're a head coach and so there really is no logic um, even when we looked at winning percentages there weren't any discrepancies or anything that said black coaches were not as winning as white coaches um, I am curious though if we were to fast forward 10 years what would that look like you know, Dad, you mentioned, was it 13 starters, Black quarterback starters? Correct. So I'm wondering at what point will the quarterbacks ever, or will they ever have a little more power and a little more say in who their quarterback's coach is? Um, also wondering if in 10 years from now, those players have retired, we're seeing more Black quarterbacks, are we going to see more Black quarterback coaches? Will we have access to that pipeline in that way, or will the trends remain the same? You know, which which gets us to the other issue. I mean, we got these starters, but but we still don't have a lot of black backup quarterbacks. Which you know, Frank Reich, and, and that 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 you know, who who were the as James expressed, you know, who were the, some of the people doing the real work coaching wise that they get to that next level? It's it's usually the guy holding the clipboard that, that 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 does that that kind of work. The other thing that that you know was brought back to my attention and the original research that was done to put the Rooney rule in place by by Janice Madden hired by Cyrus Mary and Janet and uh, Johnny Cochran she said you know they asked her this is in a recent interview well, what did the data really show to you she said and this is you know 2002 she said what it showed is exactly what you were saying raw that there were so few black men that got the jobs that they were way more qualified than the white candidates. So for her, it showed that there must be a whole lot of others that aren't getting the opportunity that, that could get in there, that, that could bring down the average success that these very successful coaches were having. I mean, it, you know, and, 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 and the only thing, the other thing she didn't, wasn't able to work in though, you know, now the average has come down in terms of the level of success the black coaches have had. Because what, what's happening is we're, we're having that other problem. Here, you can have the Houston job, right. I mean, you know, right. which, which, you know, this, this is this is the uh, uh, the other leveler that happens is to be able to be selective, to have multiple options as opposed to, well, if I don't take this job, another one may not come, and, and that's what we've seen happen with, with that Houston job in, in particular. Right. Yeah, you know, 
Bill, if you remember, the Houston job was offered up to a quarterback, a former NFL quarterback who had never had any coaching experience. Exactly. And that's how David Cully ended up getting a job because there was so much backlash toward yeah. offering the job to this young man who had no coaching experience but had been a really smart backup quarterback in the league. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, you know, Ra, you mentioned something I thought was very pivotal. And and James, you can weigh in this too. You, you mentioned as more and more black quarterbacks uh, become starters and have that power. But the question is, will they use that power to then dictate that we need more, you know, black qualified men, you know, or coaches, like men or you know, to be quarterback coaches and offensive coordinators? Will a Jalen Hurts, Will Mahomes, will, as these people assume this level of power, will they use that, that power and influence to help change this dynamic? Um, it's easy again for me as a writer to talk about that, but James, you know, you've been in locker rooms and you've been, you know, you know how fragile it is. So there's one thing for Bill Rosa, James, you ought to walk, <laughs> you know, you ought to turn your back on this generational wealth and knowing how, how owners could unplug you at, at a moment's notice, you know? So I think there's this sort of dilemma. You seem to have power, but you don't really have power. And I think the, the case made for that today is Lamar Jackson. Right. He wanted the contract that was equal to what the next best player behind him was, and he wanted Deshaun Watson's deal. Did he get it? No. Will he get it? Probably not, which takes you to here's a guy who's a generational talent who's changed the way that the quarterback position is viewed, and yet and still his, his tenure in the league is tenuous. You know, does he have two more years? Does he have three right. more years? Does he have four more years? So I don't know if he is able to go out and say, this is the guy I want brought in as my offensive coordinator or quarterback coach. And once again, we're talking pipeline. It's the same pipeline at the collegiate level also. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Bill, it's not, it's not uh, magic and LeBron. You can't, can't control, you know, who, who's coming in at, at, at that level. You know, as we close out, one thing that I do want to put in the atmosphere that that I had a chance to look at. So, so I mentioned Bill's piece that was in in Anscape, and I was trying to trying to find. So, I was googling around. I googled, you know, Bill Roden uh, barbershops, this and that, and uh, an old video clip came up, 2011, a Bill in the barbershop with the, the great Jim Brown, who, who I had a chance to see a couple times. Uh, this this weekend and, and and Jim Brown sitting in the barber chair and Bill I don't know if you remember the questions you asked asked a lot of good questions but but this 2011 and and you said you, you showed that picture of the uh, Cleveland summit right and you said to him do you think this could ever happen again and in 2011 he said without hesitation he said yes I, I think in I think he said in four or five years we'll see this kind of activity again and it was four or five years later that the Trayvon Martin activity mm. began to happen. So, so I just, just you know, the, the great Jim Brown, great, greater in a lot of ways, uh, and and still under under recognized for his uh, yeah. his accomplishments. Whose birthday is whose birthday is tomorrow, by the way? Oh, it is. Okay. Be, okay. It'll be eighty three. Tomorrow be February seventeenth. Yes, February seventeenth. <laughs> you got to remember, people are going to be watching this podcast, this episode. <laughs> For decades to come. <laughs> <laughs> you want to stand. See, you want to stand for Negroes. <laughs> see, Bill. Bill Roth, this, this is the optimism you have to have to be a Hall of Famer. You have to think like that about anything you do. That it is that great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Tomorrow, when? <laughs> May, June. <laughs> Uh, great right. job. Well, well I, I appreciate uh, this conversation. This has been the Global Sport Matters podcast featuring James Lofton and Rachel Lofton and uh, William C. Roden uh, joining us for the conversation that is Old Heads, New Thoughts. Uh, we're still sticking with that title, I guess. I know. I know. I know, Ken. We'll keep rolling with it, Ken. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right.